yard and Jeff stopped me and said, boy, we've got problems. Whatever you did back there, something happened with our water and immediately, no, there's nothing that we could have done that would have impacted your water. So Jeff and Rhonda had to start hauling their drinking water. They had to start bathing at friends' houses and families' houses. And the water gradually kind of cleared up a little bit. But every time they would work on a well around them, the water would turn black again. So finally, Jeff just was tenacious with him. He kept going after him, and they finally said, we'll give you $20,000, and you can put in a whole house reverse osmosis system. So they thought, well, maybe this is, you know, the answer to our problems. They're telling us it'll make the water clean again. And so they put the reverse osmosis system in. And right away, Rhonda started drinking the water. She was happy. You could turn the tap on again. It didn't look like motor oil coming out anymore. But Jeff was skeptical. He didn't drink the water because he was changing the pre-filters that went into the RO. So the pre-filter in his left hand is a brand new filter. And the filter in his right hand has been used for about three days. This is on a former dairy farm. Rhonda is one of the people I've seen that has the worst health deficits from what's happened out there. She started having seizures. She's on permanent medication for pain management. She has had to take a lesser job because she cannot cope with a regular work day anymore. Her cognitive abilities. This is a woman who used to fly around the Western United States and speak to bankers about finance and stock markets and super, super sharp lady. Well, we kept badgering the whole time that this stuff was going on to the state. You need to come and take a look at what's going on out here. And the state of Wyoming would tell us, we don't have the money, we don't have the manpower, we don't have the technical capability to carry out an investigation. Besides that, Encana has taken a few, and Encana is our oil and gas company from Alberta, Canada that produces in our area. They've done some water tests out there and they tell us everything's fine and we're gonna take them at their word. So myself and Jeff and Lewis and two women from a small town named Clark, Wyoming on the eastern border of Yellowstone National Park whose water had been contaminated during a drilling accident where the drill rig lost control of the gas and it blew out into the aquifers and contaminated their water, went to Denver and asked the Federal Environmental Protection Agency to come and do some water testing in our area. We said, we just want a groundwater investigation. We want to know why the water's changed colors. We want to know why people are getting sick. We want to know why Lewis's water smells like kerosene. So the EPA came up and they started doing the tests and they did three or four rounds of testing. They drilled a couple monitoring wells. They sampled the creek. They did all kinds of stuff that had never been tested before. And two years ago, in December, they released a draft report, basically it's first of its kind in the United States, saying that there were definitely chemicals in the water, and they were definitely from drilling and hydraulic fracturing. Some of the monitoring wells had benzene at 50 times the maximum contaminant level. There were alcohols, there were glycols, there were solvents such as a solvent called 2-butoxyethanol, which is a solvent used in hydraulic fracturing fluid. So this was, this was the, the headline in the, the biggest paper in Wyoming that is the most industry friendly paper you've probably ever seen and we were shocked. We felt a little vindicated because we'd had these concerns, we'd had scientists come in and do this study and we felt like we were finally going to get some answers. We wanted our lives back. We wanted to go back to being farmers and ranchers and not being politicians, not being lobbyists, not traveling to Washington, D.C. and having to meet with a bunch of knotheads that could give a damn less about what's going on in Pavilion, Wyoming. But what this, ha what this kicked off was not the beginning of a resolution, but the beginning of an even bigger battle because the state of Wyoming and industry and all the politicians from the, around the United States who have taken campaign, ca campaign contributions from this industry went to war with the Environmental Protection Agency. Our own governor traveled to DC on two occasions 
to lobby against the study and against what the people had suspected for years in Pavilion. I might also say that the, the study also found out that a reverse osmosis system does not remove these petroleum chemicals from the water. And what actually had happened at Jeff and Rhonda's house was the glycols and the petroleum hydrocarbons and the diesel range organics had actually been concentrated in what was supposed to be the clean water. So Rhonda was poisoning herself every time she opened the tap to get a drink or to make a cup of coffee. What this also resulted in was this summer, the EPA said, okay, we're turning this investigation over to the state of Wyoming, the same state who said they don't have any of the capabilities to do this. And the governor and his environmental aide stood in front of us and said, don't worry, Incana has graciously given us $1.5 million to fund your investigation with. I cannot tell you how many hours, myself and my neighbors and the people that we work with, how many days, how many months of work that we've put in to trying to tell our politicians, our representatives, trying to convince them how important this is. All it took was a few well-placed applications of cash and some pressure from the American Natural Gas Association and the governor of Wyoming, and they backed off and they turned the whole thing over. And they also left the scientists in the regional office who had done this in the lurch. They're now having to explain why they are trying to destroy the oil and gas industry in the state of Wyoming and the United States, which is a complete farce. All we wanted to know was why our water had gone bad. This is also something that's happened. This is an alfalfa field that's about three weeks away from being cut. This is a pit right in the foreground. You have the production pits and the wastewater disposal pits. This is one that the industry came in and said, we've reclaimed, everything's good, covered it over, and there's what you get. The alfalfa outside the pit is up past my knees and the stuff inside the pit, I can barely, I can see the tops of my boots through it when I walk through it. What has also happened is that if you see a little farther down the field, we're starting to get salt transferred from this upper field down to the lower field, and it's just creating a giant streak down through the field. So even when they say that they've cleaned something up, it hasn't been cleaned up. And they come out and say, oh, it's just a little salt in the soil. That's why the alfalfa is not growing. Well, no kidding. That's what we've been telling you. But that's, you know, this is our paycheck out here. This is what keeps us going. This is what feeds the beef that's going to be on your plate next year. It doesn't seem to connect. Because a lot of these guys who make these decisions, the executives for the company that make the decisions on what goes on in our land, they don't live here. They don't live in a gas field. They live in a nice cushy condominium in Denver, Colorado or Alberta, Canada. In fact, the former CEO of ExxonMobil, Rex Tillerson in the state of Texas, is part of a lawsuit trying to get a water tower that's being built next to his horse ranch. He wants to stop the, the building of that water tower because it's going to be used for hydraulic fracturing. And he doesn't want to put up with all the traffic and the heavy equipment and the disruption to his 100-acre horse farm. This is also something that happens with the infrastructure. This is right above our house. This is a separation unit that actually strips the liquids out of the gas that we have. Tight sands gas comes up with a lot of light in hydrocarbons and salt water. And it was on fire. That's triethylene glycol steaming out the top of it. Triethylene glycol, I think, boils at well over 350 degrees. It's also extremely toxic. Uh, we're the ones who find 99% of the problems that occur on our place. And then you have to try to find somebody who can come out and actually fix the problem. It's the most insane way of doing business I've ever seen. I think the biggest thing that we've seen is that people get a job in the oil field and it's a very usury 
industry. They use people up. If you get injured, if you get hurt, you're just discarded. If you have a concern, you're discarded because you're causing problems and there's somebody waiting there to take your job. And we have all sorts of young men now who got right out of school, went to work in the oil field making 50 bucks an hour. And there's no one there to be a farm hand or to do work in a lumber yard or do any other things that are necessary for work. And it's caused, the biggest thing we've probably seen in social ills is a massive amount of drug use and alcohol abuse that follows this. In Wyoming, we have it in spades to begin with. We have some of the highest drinking rates in the United States, and it goes way up when these industries come to town. It really, really causes a lot of social problems. And uh, domestic violence goes up, abuse of women goes up, the quality of education goes down, hospitals are overcrowded, jails are overcrowded, Public works cannot keep up with the water and the sewer or the demands of all the man camps that come in. And after they run crazy in your town for five or six or ten years, then they leave and go somewhere else and you're left with a giant mess. And it's very hard to recover from it. So, this is a pit that they just dug up about two months ago that we've been years trying to get them to clean up. Some of the soil here was so contaminated that you could pick a handful of soil up and stick a cigarette lighter to it and flames would come off the soil. <clears throat> I walked around this location the whole time they were doing this because I learned from experience in the past, when they're doing something, you better go watch what they're doing because the report you get back is not gonna be what actually happened. Well, we did get the report back and they said they did not encounter groundwater. <laughs> Right behind in the trees there used to be a family called the Garlands. A big operation run by a father and son. They had about 1,200 acres in our area. They ran about 600 head of cows. And they had a registered Angus bull herd that they used to breed their cows with and they raised registered bulls. The well about 600 feet behind where this pit was dug out, they were watering some of the bulls on and went out the next morning and had five dead bulls in the field. So this began a whole series of fights and trying to prove what had happened. And the deeper they dug, the more they found was wrong. And I talked to the father, Mr. Garland, who said at the very end, they were down to taking loads of cows to the sale barn and selling them so they could pay their legal fees and buy water to ship into their house. This is a tactic that's been used time and time again in the United States. When they stand up and say, there's never been a proven case of hydraulic fracturing impacting groundwater or contaminating groundwater, they ran the, the perfect setup here and they've done it time and time again. They ran this family down until they were absolutely hanging on to the knot on the end of the rope. They had nothing left. They were out of money, their health was being affected, they couldn't raise a crop anymore, and they came in and said, okay, we will settle with you. We will buy your place, but you're gonna do something for us. And you're gonna sign a non-disclosure agreement. And from here until you die, and from here until your children die, you cannot speak about this, because if you do, it will cost you $100,000 every time you speak about it. And I can guarantee you, after talking to him, he said they got just enough money to move off the place. By the time they paid the legal fees and made up for what they had expended on this, they had just enough money to move off the place and, and buy a house to live in. I've seen it happen in Colorado where a woman and her daughter lived on a little organic vegetable farm and hydraulic fracturing in the area occurred and her well started to fizz and bubble and she went to the Colorado authorities and they came out and tested the water and said, don't worry, it's fine. You know, you can bathe your children in it, you can drink it. And she developed a pituitary tumor. Well, come to find out, all along they had known that this chemical, 2BE, that they found in our water was also in her water. And one of the main things 2BE does is give you a pituitary tumor. Same thing happened there. When she couldn't afford health care anymore, when she couldn't afford to drive to town and get groceries anymore, they came in and said, we will buy you out, 
but you're going to sign a confidentiality agreement. So, effectively, that evidence disappears. It goes in their file somewhere, and it's gone for good. And it's happened time and again, and I don't think that an international boundary means a damn thing to them. It's a tactic that will be used everywhere because it's a very effective way of making people go away. What I see that may be detrimental and really affect our beef industry is the fact that you cannot go and say, these cows have been exposed to X, Y, and Z in this fracking water and the meat needs to be tested for it or the milk needs to be tested for it. And what concerns me is that we're going to actually make somebody sick. And once that happens, uh, I don't think there will be any fix in the beef industry in that part of the country. You know, if you want to be sure that your meat and your milk safe, you have to be sure of everything that that cow is ingesting. Whether that's water from the aquifer that may have chemicals in it, or if you're venting stuff out of a well that's, that's landing on the crops and the animals are eating that, you have to know what's there so you can test your products to make sure they're safe. Where we're at, we don't have a clue what to test for. How do we assure that the beef cattle we're raising are safe? We can't. We just take it for granted that nobody's gotten sick yet. But there's no way to uphold those standards when you don't know what other industries are putting into the environment. But what we've really seen in the United States is the infiltration of the groups representing a lot of the big farmers groups and beef raising groups have members now from the boards of these big corporations. We were in Washington, D.C. recently and a good friend of mine from Parker County, Texas, who's had his water horribly contaminated, was sitting in a hearing and the Texas Farm Bureau was absolutely outraged the industry was required to fence off the fracking ponds. They want the cows to be able to have that water. We're having a drought. Why should we waste that water? Well, the better question should be is why are we wasting it, injecting it down a hole full of chemicals and toxins? But we've got a bunch of politicians that see fit to take massive, massive cash donations in the United States and then turn around and do whatever industry instructs them to do. We even have this wonderful thing called ALEC the American Legislative Exchange Council. And for a small annual fee, our lawmakers, primarily the federal lawmakers and our governors, are members of ALEC. ALEC takes them to all these fancy resorts and winds them and dines them with fancy meals and grand events, and then they lay out the legislation for the next year and tell them what laws they want passed. Our own governor was recently a keynote speaker at one of the ALEC conventions in Washington, D.C. So if you think politicians can't be bought and sold, and it doesn't matter what party, I mean, we've only got two of the worthless groups in our country, neither one of them give a damn about what the average person's going through. It's all about when they get done passing the laws that make it advantageous for these corporations to make money that they can go and work for those corporations. It's happened with the GMO seeds, whatever your opinion may be of that, they revolved right through our government and got the rules passed and went right back to the GMO seeds. The oil companies have done the same. It's so bad in the state of Pennsylvania that they've actually published a book called Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Politics and the Revolving Door of Industry. <laughs> Over 50 of their highest elected officials from the last 10 years now work in the oil and gas industry. And these were the people that passed all the rules that allowed the industrialization and the drilling of the dairy farms and all the fresh food farms in Pennsylvania to take place. That allowed the fracking waste to be disposed of in the rivers to the point where the city of Pittsburgh had to shut off their freshwater intake for over a month because the contamination levels were so high in the river. And the problem is, is that these companies don't know international bounds. When Jeremy came to the United States and stood with us behind our house and spoke, and we toured him around and showed him what was going on, about a week later we all met in Washington, D.C. for a rally trying to get our government to take notice. And there were a couple guys wandering around, and a friend of mine started taking pictures of these people. She goes, look, there's a couple of industry people here. And she started taking pictures of them and they held their hands up and said they didn't want their pictures taken. 
But lo and behold, about three days later, when I get home to Pavilion, Wyoming, guess who shows up on my doorstep? It's Santos Gas employees from Australia. And they're wanting to know what's going on on my place. They followed my mother-in-law home from the post office and invited themselves out and wanted to tell me how good natural gas was and what a benefit it was going to be to the Australian people. And they wanted to see how it was done in the United States. So we showed them the door pretty quick. You know, it's you don't. <laughs> I'm going to be crude for a minute in the United States. You don't piss on my head and tell me it's raining. And that's what they've been doing to us for a long time. Well, I really see a lot of the same tactics. For instance, that the, we've never had a, a incident of contaminated water from hydraulic fracturing. It's something you always hear them say. And we've had lots of instances in the United States where it's contaminated water. And they've also bought the political system in the United States. And it seems to me from what I've seen here and some of the papers I've read and some of the TV ads I've seen, it looks pretty damn similar to what happens in our country. The politicians are looking at it for money. And a lot of these politicians, when they stop being elected by the people, are going to go to work for industry. It happens in the United States all the time. Our last governor, Dave Friedenthal, two days after leaving office as governor of the state of Wyoming, was appointed to the board of Arch Cole. But not before he put his wife in the judgeship that makes all the decisions on oil and gas and minerals in the state of Wyoming. It's a giant good old boys club, is what we call it in the States. And they stack the deck in their favor. And unless the people stand up and raise hell with them, they'll just run over the top of you because they've got it bought. You have all this massive amount of wastes to deal with in this industry. And it doesn't matter if it's coal seam gas or tight sands or shale gas or shale oil. You have the real heavy brine water that may come with coal seam gas. We have a lot of brine water, water that's 10 times saltier than the ocean, um, petrochemicals, fracking fluids, all this stuff that has to be disposed of. And the United States has a huge number of underground injection wells to dispose of this contaminated fluid. And we now have a whole area of the United States that has never had an earthquake ever. Clear back through even the verbal history of the Native American, there's never been an earthquake there. And now we have towns that have hundreds of earthquakes a month. And it's all been linked to the reinjection of wastewater. There's a place called Azle, Texas. And I believe in the kind of the northeastern part of Texas had never had an earthquake. There's days they have 40 and 50 earthquakes now. There's a place that you can get on the internet, the Bayou Corn sinkhole. It was a big salt dome, an open salt dome they were injecting waste into and it collapsed and now it is eating the bayou of Louisiana. There is a sinkhole that is now several hundred yards across both directions and thousands of feet deep and land continually sloughs in. Bayou Corn, the small town, is completely abandoned now. People have had to leave their homes, have had to walk away from everything, and the sinkhole is gradually eating the town and the bayou. There have been earthquakes just related to the fracking process alone because it's the injection of fluid under high pressure into the ground. Very often, oil and gas is located near faults. So you heard me mention earlier about California. There's the Monterey Shale in California. It underlies the Central Valley where 80 to 90 percent of the fresh produce for the United States is grown. And they want to drill 20,000 shale wells in there in the next 10 years. Immediately under that is the San Andreas Fault, the most active fault in North America. Governor Jerry Brown has just asked the people of California to voluntarily reduce their water usage in their homes by 20 percent because of the drought at the same time that they want to pass through legislation to allow them to use 8 to 10 million gallons per frack on these wells. So everything, 
take common sense and put it in your hip pocket when it comes to this. And there have been earthquakes everywhere, including Arkansas, Oklahoma, Illinois, Wyoming, Colorado, Texas, New Mexico. There's earthquakes occurring everywhere this is taking place. It is damaging people's houses, it's damaging their wells. It's creating a whole flurry of controversy in the United States, but it hasn't stopped them from doing it yet. So now here's the mess we're left with. This is what Pavilion looks like now. The blue dots are water wells. Our, menis, our domestic water wells that we get our water for our homes from and our cattle and our gardens. And the red wells are gas wells. This is a small gas field. This is just a shade over 200 wells. Tight sands, they said, oh, this is the easy stuff to get. And we're paying a horrible price for it. Our property right now is worth zero. We couldn't sell our place if we wanted to. We couldn't give our property away if we wanted to. My wife who's here, her family has lived there for 60 years. We have four generations. Kathy's parents are there. My wife and I are there, our children, and we have three grandchildren. We wanted them to have the opportunity and the ability to learn the things that we learned. We wanted them to have the ability to disconnect from the modern world, to go out and learn what it's like to work with an animal, to learn where your food comes from, to learn what it's like to put in a hard day's work and feel good about it at the end of the day. I think the hardest thing to, to think about is that our kids grew up there, my wife grew up there, and it's, it's really a special place to live and it's been destroyed by somebody who wants to make money. It wasn't about energy independence or, or making life better, it was about them making money. And now we have the prospect of having to leave because the water's contaminated and they can never haul us enough water in five gallon jugs to make up for what they've done. And the air is contaminated, you walk outside you can smell the raw petroleum smell in the air. It's not worth it. There isn't any lifestyle worth being poisoned over. I mean, there's a lot of things. We've fought pretty hard for this, and we're gonna to continue to fight for it, but it really comes down to the fact that if we stay there, we're gonna poison ourselves. That's the hardest thing to deal with. Where are we gonna